All right, so let's talk about digestion. I don't know if you realize this, but your body is a bit like a donut. Um, basically, if you know what a donut is, it's just a tube, right, with a hole through it. And you are essentially a hole through you as well, going from your mouth down to your anus. That is a hole going through your body. Now, granted, it goes in all sorts of different directions and turns and has sphincters that close and so forth. But essentially, you have a you kind of have this hollow tube going through you. That's kind of still outside of your body, even though you think of it as being inside your body. But the true inside of your body is your tissues and fluids and stuff like that. So, um, in a sense, that the food that you've chewed is still external until you've digested it and brought it across the cell membranes. Does that make sense a little bit? So, the um, Digestive system is all about this tube and all the accessory organs that go along with it. Where does digestion really start though? It starts in your mouth. Mastication is a huge part of digestion for us and other animals. And so you'll chew up food and break it down mechanically along with salivary enzymes that help to begin to do some of the initial digestion. And they'll turn it into a bolus that you'll swallow. And this is pretty true for a lot of animals. Now, do all animals have a digestive system? Most well, sponges don't have a digestive system. They actually absorb food directly to their cells. They'll just literally take it through their cells. Um, and so that's different. They also um, um, might have things like jellyfish where their mouth and their anus is the same hole. Again, it'll be very simple. It'll bring food in through their mouth, be digested, and it'll go back out that same hole. You start to see more complex digestive systems with some animals that can, again, absorb directly into their body. Even some Mammals or semi-mammals like um, platypus um, don't have a true stomach, but they still have a digestive system and things like that. And, um, and then some get a lot more complex. You know, you can think about big ungulates and herbivores where they'll have multiple stomachs in quotes. That There's only one true stomach, but they'll have other huge vessels that hold the grass that they've chewed up and bacteria and things will eat on it. A lot of things we can't digest as humans. And those include things like cellulose. You can't go out and eat that grass and digest it. It's, it's roughage. So there's all sorts of different adaptations based on the type of animal you are. But again, this kind of basic thing that we're gonna describe in humans can be applied to some degree to other animals at some level. So again, we're gonna overview the digestive system. I'm gonna kind of give you the, the basics of it. And then as the next lectures occur, I'll give you even more specific information. You know, how and where is food broken down is important and where is, is it absorbed? How is the digestive waste concentrated and eliminated? These are all factors of talking about the digestive system. How is digestion regulated by the gastrointestinal tract? Realize a great deal of your body is dedicated towards digestion. And that includes the nerves. There's even nerves that really help coordinate the digestive system. You can almost think of it as a secondary brain in quotes because it's so much of it is regulated outside of your brain for that matter. You also have a lot of immune cells associated with the digestive system, because again, that is kind of a front line from the external world and your true body tissues. You also harbor a lot of bacteria that live in your body. Um, 
in your digestive system. In fact, there's more bacterial cells that live on you and in your digestive system than there are human cells. And that's because bacterial cells are so much smaller, but there's actually, if you count the sheer number, there's actually more. So again, the um, going on about the digestive system, let's see if I can move this out of the way. Anyway, it's, uh, it says the process of the digestive system overview. We have the lumen, and I just remember I just described it as you got a tube going through your body from mouth to anus. You ingest food and immediately secretions take place. They start in your mouth and then they happen in your stomach. Your soft, not so much your esophagus, but the esophagus moves the food down. But there'll be acids and enzymes in your stomach that'll help break down proteins. And then it'll go into your small intestine, which is really the workhorse of most of the actual absorption of nutrients and digestion. And that leads to the large intestine, which is main job is to bring water back out of the feces that's being formed. Um, then it reaches your colon and then it's excreted. So there's excretions and absorption that takes place through this entire process. Motility is happening by smooth muscles that are turning back and forth. Remember how we talked about smooth muscles? There's slower contraction they, and how their myosin actin is set up kind of in a diagonal arrangement. And again, self-protection is very important. So here is the digestive system of humans. You can see the parotid gland, the sublingual gland, and the submandibular gland are all part of the salivary glands um, that then provide fluids towards um, breaking down and lubricating the food that you're chewing. Some digestion takes place. For instance, your salivary glands have um, enzymes that help break down carbo carbohydrates like amylase. Your tongue's obviously helping roll, roll the food around and taste it to make sure if it's dangerous or not. If it's bitter, you'll spit it out most likely, unless you know it to be safe and you've learned to enjoy that food. But that is your first line of defense. It also might be able to help get rid of some of the bacteria that you may feed on. Your teeth obviously are masticating the food. <clears throat> then the food will enter into the esophagus and the esophagus through peristalsis will move the food bolus to your stomach and then ultimately through an esophagus, through a sphincter that leads into your stomach. You can literally lay upside down and technically the food will continue moving towards your stomach because of the muscles in your esophagus moving it towards the stomach. If you were to put a stethoscope on, you could listen to yourself, drink some water, and then you could literally hear the droplets as they enter into your stomach in this esophagus opening. Obviously, we talk about acid reflux. We're talking about acids going back into the esophagus, which we don't want. In your stomach, this is where, again, acids do most of the job of the stomach is about breaking down proteins. <clears throat> and so we're going to be using a low pH acid that will denature the proteins and help break the hydrogen bonds that join proteins together. And then you're going to have an enzyme called pepsin that helps to further break down these proteins. Pepsin is obviously an enzyme. We call it a protease. A protease is an enzyme that breaks down protein. And that can be found in your stomach. Then the acid has to be neutralized. This is done a large part by your pancreas and that'll help to neutralize the acids. Why do we need to neutralize the acids? Well, it's going to inhibit our ability to digest and absorb food in the small intestine. Because remember a lot of enzymes that your body makes to help in digestion are proteins. That's what enzymes are. Enzymes are proteins that speed up a chemical reaction. And so if you're breaking down your own proteins because you kept the food acidic as it entered into your small intestine, that's gonna be a problem. In addition, the acid could be harmful to your, your body. You probably have heard of things like ulcers. Some, we try to protect our body from getting 
um, ulcers. Ulcers are basically where the mucus is thinned down to the point where the acids in your stomach can actually cause burning sensations on your skin tissue. A bacteria called hylobacteria or something like that, I think that's the right name, hylopyrolis, hylobacter pyrolis, I believe now that I'm getting my memory back in line, is a bacteria that eat on that mucus. And then that's one of the causes, main causes of ulcers. They used to think it was only due to stress, but it's actually also due to a bacterial pathogen that specializes in living in that acidic environment. You also notice your liver is gonna be very important down the road for when the nutrients gets into your body and goes into the blood, it'll be important for um, further metabolism and, and things of that nature. It also is important for making um, bile. So the liver will help make bile by the breakdown of bile um, of, by the breakdown of hemoglobin into, into bilirubin. That bile salts will enter into the gallbladder, as you'll see later, and help in the absorption of fats in the small intestine. So the bile or the gallbladder is actually a storage area for bile, bile salts that is secreted into the small intestine as well. And then you'll see the small intestine isn't so small, it's actually larger than the large intestine. It's smaller in diameter, but it's actually much, much, much longer. And so you can see it wrapping around in all sorts of different directions. And then it ultimately will lead to the large intestine. Most of the food, again, will, will be absorbed there. And then when you get to the large intestine, we're talking about absorbing water. Now, the small intestine will absorb a huge amount of water also. But the large intestine is mostly about getting rid of whatever wasn't digested and absorbed previously. So the large intestine's job will be to compact the leftover food into what we call poop, right? <laughs> Ultimately. Um, we always think of poop as being really disgusting, but really it's just your lunch that wasn't digested combined with some enzymes and bile salts and things like that. So it might be nasty, but it's not as nasty if you really think about it, what it really is. I'm not saying I want to smear it on myself, but it is just food that's been broken down and rotted in a sense and sped up. I mean, obviously it's disgusting by the general thoughts of it, but anyway, you got the gist. There's all sorts of different structures as we go through it. You're saying, and so you'll see the lumen changes quite a bit as far as this, the mucus layer that's underneath it. So the lumen is the actual hole. And then you'll see this kind of basic structure throughout, whether it be the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestines, or the large intestines, you're going to have this submucosa layer, but it's going to vary quite a bit. You're going to have a mucosa layer, a submucosa layer. You're going to have smooth muscles kind of going in alternate directions. You're going to have lots of different mucus glands and some mucus glands, and you're going to have um, a variety of um, immune cells and patches of immune cells that help protect you, along with lots of capillaries. Capillaries are important for absorption of nutrients, and then those nutrients will travel to the liver often or the lymphatic gland, depending on what nutrient we happen to be talking about. So again, the organs of the alimentary canal in order would be the mouth, the, uh, the, the mouth, excuse me, the, fer uh, the pharynx, the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and anus. So these are the major organs. And then you have a bunch of accessory organs like the liver, the pancreas, the salivary glands, and so forth. The mouth, again, will be involved in mastication, which is just a fancy word of saying chewing combined with saliva. And then the initiation of swallowing will be done by the tongue. So the tongue will push the food back uh, towards the nasal pharynx. And then um, once that food bolus is pushed back, it becomes an autonomic, automatic response and reflux. 
where you'll stop breathing. In the case of us, we'll stop breathing and the food will be completely out of control at that point and we'll just swallow and the esophagus will begin to contract. Now the pharynx serves as a passageway for both air and food in humans particularly. And so it'll block the lungs when you swallow so that you don't get food into your lungs. Some animals like wolves though can actually eat and breathe at the same time. They don't have to do the back and forth. That seems to be something that's kind of due to us and the way we develop the more sophisticated versions of talking that a wolf doesn't have, for instance. Again, there's gonna be two muscle layers, a longitudinal layer and a circular layer. So if you look at the smooth muscles going around these tubes throughout the body, some of them are going pointing towards you and some are pointing lengthwise, does that make sense? So if you do a cross section of the lumen, you see muscles going this way and you see new muscles going around it. And again, I'll just kind of turn it back and forth, ultimately pushing the food from the mouth to the anus. It'll start, um, and we call that peristalsis. So here is the reflex response. You can see the bolus is what we call the food that you've masticated. It hits the back of your throat. The epiglottis will actually come down and cover up the larynx, and then the food will go down into the esophagus, of course, unless you're laughing and telling a funny joke, and then that kind of gets messed up. And that's what, and it really sucks to swallow or, you know, take your water into your little bit of your lungs. Isn't it one of the most awful feelings? That's obviously a survival reflex to start coughing like crazy to get that mucus out of there. And then here you can see the food as, as traveling down or the bolus is traveling down the esophagus to the stomach. Again, the gravity is important, but peristaltic waves are also important. So the esophagus runs from the pharynx down to the stomach through the diaphragm. The diaphragm, remember, is this muscular layer that um, surrounds, is underneath the chest cavity that contracts and relaxes, opening up the chest cavity and constricting the chest cavity in regards to breathing. So the, you know, you'll, if you have it, make sure you look at my respiratory notes. I will probably assign that, obviously I've assigned that to you to read or I will in your all cases. The diaphragm will contract, opening up your chest cavity or relax, bringing your chest cavity together or vice versa. But either way, that's what's controlling the air pressure. Well, the, esophagus will go through that muscular layer. In fact, if you get hiccup, it's, it hiccups, it's due to the diaphragm having a muscle spasm. It's not shown in this picture though. Um, so then again, the esophagus is going to lead to the stomach. And again, this is just the general overview and I'll hit on more specifics of each of these different organs, but the stomach initially acts as a storage tank for food. And, a, and again, it's initial site of food breakdown, particularly proteins with a low pH, highly acidic environment, along with a specialized protease called pepsin that breaks down proteins. And again, those enzymes that break down proteins are called proteases. Once that a food, the bolus becomes acidic and broken down, it's been sitting in your stomach for a while, we now refer to that as chyme, which is the processed food that will then be squirted into the small intestine through another sphincter between the stomach and the small intestine. Not really anything much gets absorbed in the stomach, except um, things like alcohol and aspirin can be absorbed in the stomach. The, for the most part, the stomach functions as a storage tank and initial breakdown of proteins in particular. Here's your basic stomach anatomy. So again, um, the esophagus is coming down and you can see right at the top of the stomach, the tube where the esophagus is coming in. There you'll see a cardio 
esophageal sphincter. Remember, sphincters are like round rings of muscles that open and close. So they'll close and help prevent the acids from going back up into the esophagus. Then the food will be stored in there and you'll see there's lots of different muscle layers going in different directions. The top part of the stomach will be called the fundus. And then um, you'll see there's lots of folds called the rugi of mucosa. You'll see the stomach kind of has a greater curvature. And then the inside of the stomach has a lesser curvature. And then it all leads to what we call a pyloric sphincter, which again is another group of smooth muscles that open and close. And that's where this, the, in this case, the chime is squirted into the small intestine. The first part of the small intestine is actually known as the duodenum. And that's where the chime is neutralized by the pancreas. There'll be buffers and things like that to get the acidic, acidity back to a more pleasant pH. I don't know if it gets quite to neutral, but something of that nature. So anyway, again, the stomach will have these internal folds. So you got your muscle layers, and then you have the mucosa layer where you have these pits. And you'll see another picture of that a little bit later. And here's some more tissues as well. There's also an omentum, I don't think it's shown in this picture, that will cover um, the stomach and the intestines. That's kind of a fatty looking tissue. That's kind of net looking. And that provides um, insulation and protection to the abdominal cavity. Has anybody ever seen the omentum before? Again, it's gonna be kind of a, looks like a net draped over the, the, the stomach tissues and intestines. It has kind of a, a fatty appearance that looks like a net. I'll try to find a picture of that later for you. Now, again, the small body's job is it's a major digestive organ. It's the site of most of nutrient absorption as well as water, actually. Um, there's a muscular tube extending from the pyloric sphincter into this ilicilioc valve, which opens and closes. And that comes um, from the posterior side of the abdomen. The small intestine can be broken up into different portions. The first part that's attached to the stomach is called the duodenum, and it curves around the head of the pancreas. So the pancreas, as you can see in this picture, is right next to the stomach. And then you'll see the duodenum. That's the first part of the small intestine. And then anteriorly to the duodenum is the duodenum, which is the, the lengthier part of it. And then the final part of it that attaches to the large intestine will be called the ileum. This is probably, I think around 20 feet long if I remember right. And then the large intestine will basically kind of window pane around the small intestines. So you'll have your small intestines and then you'll have the large intestines kind of going around it in a loop. So it basically frames the internal abdomen. So here's how it frames it. So imagine inside this, this space, that will be the um, small intestines. So you can see how the large intestines are um, framing it. And then that ultimately will lead to the colon and then ultimately to the anal canal and anal sphincter. So the main job of the large intestines is to make um, you know, feces essentially. This connective tissue might, that's being shown in this picture, the yellowish stuff, may be part of the omentum, but let's see if I can find a better picture just to be sure. We also have an appendix, which in other primates, other apes, is much more pronounced. But in our case, it actually is very residual. So we apparently seem to have come from a species that where the appendix was rather large. It's more found in other great apes. 
but in us, it's actually very much uh, um, rudimentary now. So again, the large intestine's job is to absorb water, eliminate indigestible food from the body as such as feces, but it really doesn't um, take any, doesn't really do anything more as far as digestion of food. There's also goblet cells that help to produce mucus to help lubricate that feces and help it to move on. But again, remember your large intestine is, is big job is to absorb water. Have you ever, I don't know if you've ever been in this situation, but when you get older, you may experience this. But if you miss a bowel movement, more water is absorbed out of the feces. Have you ever noticed that the bowel, the next time you try to go poop, it's actually harder to do? That's because more water has been absorbed out of your feces and it's not as slick, the mucus and so forth. Um, a lot of the lymphatic tissues are associated with the appendix, but if your appendix ever gets inflamed, it, it goes into appendicitis, which can be a life and death situation, it causes real pain. So if you ever get a pain in your lower abdomen area, one possibility is an appendicitis, and that would be something that is a medical emergency that needs to be taken care of, because if it ruptures, you can have septicemia and serious infections. Anyway, here's your colon, it's ascending and transverse. Um, you got your rectum and then your anus is your external body opening. That's the end of the ride for the food that you've taken in. The large intestine has pits also. So we didn't, I didn't show you a picture, but the small intestine, maybe if I can go back, I can show you. The small intestine has villi, finger-like projections. So the stomach has rugia, which are like pits again, and valleys. And the small intestines, I didn't see it in this picture, but it has finger-like projections, and I'll show you that in a moment. The large intestine also has pits and more smooth, the actual structure. So this is the mucosal layer on top, and then you have your submucosal layer, and you got your smooth muscles going in the different directions. And then you're gonna, again, you're gonna have goblet cells that are important for making mucus, as well as prior patch cells, I believe, but either way, immune cells that help protect your body. So here's your alimentary canal again. Um, you can see that the general structure is present. You got your lumen, which is your hole. You're gonna have a variety of lymph nodes and glands associated with it. They're called some mucosa glands. You're gonna have some smooth muscles. Um, let's see, there's a name for those muscles. This is called a muscle layer here. Then you're gonna have your submucosa layer, which you get have your glands, and then you're gonna have more smooth muscles that go in those different directions. And that's where a lot of the peristalsis takes place. You'll see a lot of nerves are associated throughout the whole process to coordinate your muscle contractions. Again, the mucosa layer is the first layer with the lumen, and then the submucosa layer is right beneath that. And then there's gonna be plenty of blood vessels there. So the, you can see the lumen, then you see the, the, the lumen is the hole, then you see the mucosa layer. You can see some smooth muscles, then you see the submucosa layer, and you see some more smooth muscles, and then you see the connective tissue on the outside. Anyway, just takes a little time to read through these slides and get the rest of those areas. You have the cirrhosis, that's the outermost layer. Okay. So here's what's basically happening again as an overview, and then we'll we're going to talk about each one in much more detail. But again, the mouth is in involved with mastication. So we've got MSDNA. So M means the motility, 
S means secretions, what's being secreted. D is what's being digested. And A is what's being absorbed. So the mouth, it's all about mastication and digestion. So the mouth is going to be also involved in motility, that's swallowing and chewing. The um, secretions will be from the salivary glands, like the parotid salivary glands. That's gonna help in digestion of carbohydrates and lipids. Lipases is an example of an enzyme that breaks down lipids. Amylase is an enzyme that breaks down carbohydrates. There's no real absorption taking place in the mouth. Some alcohol can be absorbed in the mouth, but for the most part, um, absorption is pretty minimal when it comes to the basic foods. Then we're gonna to get to the esophagus, which again is gonna be all about moving the food down to the stomach and then going through the esophageal sphincter into the stomach. We're gonna have motility going on there. We're gonna have peristaltic mixing. So the food's gonna be churning back and forth, the bolus becoming chime. It's gonna be mixed over and over again. Um, with the help of parietal cells, we're gonna get hydrochloric acid in there. That's what HCL is. And then pepsin is gonna be formed. It's listed here as pepsinogen, but pepsinogen means it's a pro-enzyme. And then it's gonna be converted into pepsin. And then gastric lipases and chief cells will be used to help break down lipids. We're gonna have a mucus layer and stuff like that. But what's happening is proteins are being digested and fats are being digested. Uh, what's being absorbed? Not very much, except for things like alcohol and aspirin. Your small intestines is where the chyme will go into, as I mentioned before. Um, and immediately it's going to uh, be mixed with biocarbonate. That will help to neutralize the hydrochloric acid. Um, there'll be other enzymes involved that help to digest proteins like trypsin and chymotrypsin. These are all examples of proteases. Your liver is gonna make bile. Remember that's the breakdown of blood. And then that's gonna go into your gallbladder as bile salts. And then that's gonna help in the absorption of fats. There's gonna be all sorts of secretions taking place in your, in your small intestine. These will come from things like goblet cells to help make you mucus. And you're gonna have a variety of hormones involved in the digestive process. And then you're going to have the carbohydrates, fats, proteins, which in this case is listed as polypeptides and nucleic acids. All of these major macromolecules are gonna be absorbed. So the major macromolecules of living organisms are carbohydrates, fats, proteins, which in this case are polypeptide chains and nucleic acids, which make up DNA. Peptides will be actively transported into the, the cell membrane. Remember that means it's gonna require ATP. Um, glucose and fructose will be brought in by secondary transport, active transport, which I'll show you later, but that may include um, uh, things like, um, well, I was gonna say, uh, what I was about to tell you. That will include um, ex or endocytosis. Excuse me, it took me, sorry, it took me a moment to remember that, as well as a variety of peptides. So anyway, we'll get into more of that, but water is also absorbed dramatically. So the small intestine is very important for absorption of water, vitamins, and minerals. Lastly, again, the large intestine is all about getting out whatever water it can, maybe some vitamin K and stuff like that. But it's ultimately about getting rid of whatever you cannot digest in your small intestine. So again, the stomach's gonna be about um, digesting proteins. It's gonna do so with a variety of cells. There's going to be parietal cells that make hydrochloric acid. There's going to be chief cells that make lipases. What is a lipase again, everybody? It's an enzyme that breaks down lipids. It's going to also make pepsin, which is a protease that breaks down proteins. And then it's also going to make sure that it provides mucus and biocarbonate. Why do we need mucus? 
That is to help protect the underlying mucosal layer from being eaten by the acids and the enzymes. So there'll be biocarbonate present in the mucosal layer to neutralize the acids. So the idea is that the lumen, the whole itself, will have these um, hydrochloric acids and lipases and so forth. So here is the uh, stomach. You can see that it has lots of these, um, the mucosal layer has these holes and channels or lined with these different cells that I just described. So each one of the epithelial cells is located and some of them will be chief cells and things like that. You also see closely associated with it is capillaries and glands and various things. Right under the, that, you'll see this, again the submucosal layer. So the mucosal layer is on top, the submucosal layer is underneath. And then right underneath that, you've got your circular muscles going in one direction and your longitudinal muscles going in the opposite. So let's look at these gastric pits. Again, that's the, what we saw in this previous picture here. Those are gastric pits. Does everybody see that? So the gastric pits are lined up with these specialized cells. Some are known as parietal cells. Again, the job of the parietal cells is to make um, hydrochloric acid. Let me make sure I got that done. Yep, make hydrochloric acid. Chief cells are important for making pepsinogen which will be activated into pepsin when it comes in contact with hydrochloric acid. G cells that are important for making gastrin. And then we also have mucosa cells that are important for making mucus. So what you're looking at the lumen right here in this gastric gland is the parietal cells and the chief cells. So notice on the right, number two is the parietal cell releasing hydrochloric acid. On the left, the chief cell is releasing pepsinogen. Now remember, pepsinogen, you see, every, you see ogen, you know it's an inactive enzyme. So that hydrochloric, action, that hydrochloric acid is going to activate pepsinogen into pepsin, making it an enzyme that can break down protein. So again, that's happening in the gastric pits. So let's again talk about the different cells that are found in the gastric pit. So here we can see another picture of the lumen of the stomach. Again, this is in the mucus layer. You see these epithelial cells. And then as you go further down, you're gonna see specialized cells like the mucus neck cell. What does the mucus neck cell secrete? By definition of its name, mucus. It's gonna secrete mucus and biocarbonate. What is the importance of this mucus? It's going to make a fine layer of mucus on top of the cells so that your acids and your pepsinogen do not eat the cells. What activates the release of this mucus? Well, maybe you're getting a little bit of an ulcer. Maybe you're getting a little irritation. Maybe not necessarily an ulcer, but some of the acids reaching your actual epithelial cells. Then that'll trigger those cells to release more mucus add biocarbonate to neutralize the fat, or excuse me, neutralize the acid and protect those cells from being eaten. You also have parietal cells. Again, the job of parietal cells is to make hydrochloric acid. We also call it gastric acid. So your stomach has a pH around two or three. So it's incredibly low, the pH. What's its job gonna be? Help to, to digest proteins, but it also kills bacteria. That's really important, right? You don't want to get an infection. <coughs> so the acid will kill most of the proteins that you eat. Now, some, unfortunately, some bacteria can still get past this. Some pathogens can still get past your stomach acids. 
but the vast majority of potential pathogens are destroyed by the acids in your stomach. Notice what helps cause it to release, acetylcholine, or a hormone called gastrin and histamine. Remember, acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter. As soon as you think about food, your body will cause you to drool a little bit. Have you ever noticed your mouth gets a little bit wet when you think about if you're hungry, when you think about pizza or something, your mouth becomes a little more lubricated? Well, your stomach actually will release a little bit of acid by the thought of food. The neurotransmitters, acetylcholine, are helping to stimulate those cells to cause the release of um, hydrochloric acid. You also have enterochromaffin like cell, which also is important for stimulating the gastric and acid secretions. So you remember histamine is an, a um, chemical that will help to stimulate the release of uh, parietal cells, releasing hydrochloric acid. And then we have chief cells. Do you remember what chief cells do again? Chief cells will secrete pepsinogen that will be activated by the acid to make pepsin. And it will also release gastric lipase. What does lipases do? The lipases break down lipids. So that's what the lip lipases will do. So again, the chief cells are going to be important for helping in digestion of proteins and fats in the stomach. You have D cells, which are known as somatostatin. Um, they will release um, this chemical that will help to stop the parietal cells from release, releasing hydrochloric acid. So they're important in regulation, regulating how much gastric acid is made or hydrochloric acid. And G cells are also important in this gastrin as well. Um, they will stimulate gastric acid. So G cells and D cells are important in helping regulate when parietal cells will release their hydrochloric acid. So this picture here is showing you how the mucosa layer is very important in protection against um, being destroyed by the acids in your stomach. Because remember the acids in your stomach the gastric acids, the hydrochloric acid can reach a pH of two. So you could literally take your gastric juices, put it on a piece of metal and it will begin to, to digest that metal. It's that sh terrible of an acid. You'd hate to have it on your skin. But this mucosa layer that is secreted by these um, gastric mucus cells will form this mucus layer and they'll add biocarbonate so that it provides a protective layer from your stomach lumen and the acids in there and actually harming your cells, your actual body. So that biocarbonate will neutralize the acids. There are mucus droplets that are involved in this as well. As you can see, the mucus droplets will actually, through um, exocytosis, will be released I believe, or it could just go right through the membrane. But either way, they will be released into that layer. What about parietal cells? How do they secrete hydrochloric acid? You don't have to really worry about memorizing this chemical pathway at this point, but this is something you should study at some point. But this is a parietal cell. And what you see here is water comes along and is cleaved with CO2 to make biocarbonate and hydrochloric uh, hydrogen ion. Remember, acids are made up of hydrogen ions. So that hydrogen ion will literally be pumped into the lumen um, through co-transport. So the, the hydrogen ion will be transported out into the lumen while potassium gets transported back in. Notice how similar this is to things like what you've seen with nerves or what you've seen in respiration. When I talked about respiration the other day, CA actually stands for carbonic anhydrase. So if you remember from my respiratory lecture, 
carbonic anhydrase um, converts carbon dioxide into carbonic acid, or we have carbonic, or carbo carboxylic acid, excuse me, that gets um, converted into biocarbonate. And that biocarbonate will actually be pumped into the interstitial fluids and then can enter into your capillary system where it can be released as carbon dioxide from your lungs or be used in buffering. Notice that there's another co-transport taking place where the biocarbonate is being released into the interstitial fluid and chloride is being pumped into the cell and then ultimately being pumped into the lumen of the stomach. So if you look at the top part, you'll see the hydrogen ions are being pumped out into the lumen and the chloride is being pumped out. That is how you get hydrochloric acid into the lumen of your stomach. This is how the parietal cells do it. Obviously, there's some other complexity to it, but this is the basics of that. So again, it's just the mere thought of food that can trigger some of this digestive system to take place. Realize that your stomach has its own, and intestines has its own nervous system as well, known as the enteric nervous system, or ENS. Literally means little brain. So your stomach and your small intestines, your esophagus, all that kind of stuff, there are uh, neurons that are responsible for helping regulate that. But your brain and spinal cord and all that kind of stuff is also involved, including the medulla oblongata. So you can see the picture of food or think about food, and that will actually travel down long nerves that helps trigger the enteric nervous system to kick in the gear. So you can see that the long nerves traveling down from the brain or the medulla oblongata through this the pre-ganglion you know, ganglion parasympathetic neurons through the vagus nerve will reach the enteric nervous system or the enteric plexus. And then it will trigger all these different nerves and, and cells to start doing its thing, like releasing acidic acid and mucus and, and secretions and all sorts of stuff. Even my own mouth can get more lubricated just by the sheer thought of food. It's, it's classical conditioning even. Remember when they rang the bell and the dog began to drool when it, when it learned to associate the ring of the bell with the side of the food? Your thought of thinking about food it can actually cause you to, to kick in the gear this enteric nervous system. And that's what's being shown in this simple model here. You have stretch receptors on your stomach or your intestines that will expand and that will stimulate the enteric nervous system. That's what's being shown at the bottom. So pH, your pH will change if you have acids in your stomach or lack of acids. Your stomach stretches when you eat, right? Your intestines stretch when you eat, put food in it. Osmolarity changes. What is osmolarity? That's the amount of salts and waters and things like that. That changes after you eat too. So all these different things are cues to your body that digestion is taking place. And the enteric nervous system will take over. And again, that is called the little brain in quotes. That is the, di the, the nervous system of your stomach. So in a sense, remember, I don't know if you ever heard this idea, oh, you must have a brain in your stomach or, or a mind of your own. Your stomach has a mind of its own. That's, there's some truth to that because the enteric nervous system is the brain of the stomach. That's what's coordinating all these different cells and motility and so forth that take place. Again, your higher brain will also be involved. And so the sight, the smell, and that's what you see at the top of this picture, will trigger sensory receptors that will travel to the cephalic brain, your real brain, that will then send through parasympathetic nerves and sympathetic nerves will trigger digestion. Obviously, best digestion takes place with parasympathetic nerves. Sympathetic nerves makes it harder to digest because you're in fright or flight. Remember that when we talked about the fright or flight responses versus, um, and remember those are all autonomic nervous system. Remember the autonomic nervous system versus outside of your conscious control that takes place? So a lot of this is taking place without your conscious thinking of it. So the interneurons that are found in the 
um, enteric nervous system will kick into gear and then it'll travel down the efferent neurons. Remember the sensory neurons, which are the afferents. They'll, they'll notice stretch receptors, your brain's response and thinking about it. All this stuff will kick into gear and the smooth muscles will start going, doing peristalsis, moving back and forth. There'll be secretions from your different cells causing enzymes to be released and parietal. So all this kind of stuff is taking place. Even the type of food will affect how fast your digestive rate takes place. If you eat something that's like a simple sugar, your digestive system moves a lot more rapidly than something that's, that takes a long time to digest like fats and proteins. So all this comes into gear. Again, it's gonna be long reflexes when it's traveling down from your brain to your enteric nervous system and short reflexes when you're talking about your stomach expanding or, or shrinking. All that is information to the enteric nervous system, the little brain, the, the brains of your um, digestive system. And then obviously the response is the digestive system itself doing what it's supposed to do. All the things that I'm about to describe, it's the muscle contractions, relaxation, the enzymes being released and so forth. So again, these are just, we'll go back and forth from this picture, but this is just a reminder of what some of those different cells do. And then this is the model. So we have mucus cells, parietal cells, intercomathin like cells, chief cells, D cells, and G cells. This is what's being secreted. And let's go back and forth between the model and this picture so that we have an idea of how the digestion takes place in the stomach. So this is a model showing you the enteric nervous system working along with the, the brain and the spinal cord. So on the left, you see on top of the picture, you see number one, you see food. So you've eaten something and it travels down from your mouth through the esophagus down into the lumen of the stomach. So there's amino acids in your food, right? Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins and peptides. There are receptors in your stomach that will pick that up. And then using this, the short reflex, it'll travel to the enteric nervous system, the enteric plexus. Remember, that is the little brain of the stomach. That information will travel back as a short reflex, causing the G cells to release gastrin. What does gastrin do? Let's go back to the previous picture. G cells release gastrin. So acetylcholine, peptides, and amino acids are there. That's what causes gastrin to be released. And that will ultimately, the gastrin apparently will stimulate gastric acid secretion. So let's follow where gastrin goes. So do G cells, if you look at G cells, right? Everybody see G cells? It'll go over to two, which is our gastrin. The gastrin, follow the gastrin down, that's the chemical. It'll travel to ECL cells and the histamine is released. What is ECL, ECL cells again? Well, you don't have to memorize it. Let's just go look at the picture. It's the enterochromaffin like cell. So histamine is released. What stimulated it? Gastrin and, and obviously the nerves like acetylcholine neurotransmitters, and that causes, apparently this histamine will cause the gastric cells to release acid. So if you go look at gastrin, follow gastrin down, it's a black arrow, it'll travel down to the parietal cells. And what does the parietal cell do? It releases acid. So you see how the G cells release gastrin, Gastrin travels down to the ECL cells. The ECL cells release histamine. And then the histamine causes the parietal cells to release hydrochloric acid. Also gastrin apparently can also work directly on parietal cells and cause it to release acid. Remember acid is the hydrogen ions. Hydrogen ions are the, are the acids along with hydrochloric acid in this case. So your stomach's got all this food, hydrochloric acid's kicked in the gear, it's beginning to digest protein. Eventually that food's gonna leave your stomach, right? 
it's going to be released as chyme into the small intestine in small squirts. And so the hydrochloric acid is present in your stomach. That's going to interact. Initially, the hydrochloric, in, the hydrochloric acid is going to interact with the receptors that travels as a reflex to the enteric plexus and then travels to the chief cells. What do you think the chief cells are going to do with the, with the presence of hydrochloric acid in the stomach through this reflex arc? and receptors. This one should be an easy one because you can see it in the picture. It's cause it's going to release pepsinogen. Pepsinogen is a pro, is a zymogen and all these big terms. But basically it's just a pre-enzyme that's going to become pepsin. So pepsinogen will be converted to pepsin. Why do we have stuff in this pre-hormone, pre-enzyme form, I mean. Why do you think we have, a zymogen is the term for pre-enzyme, but don't get too bent out of shape on a big term. Why do we have this as a pro-protease, pro-enzyme? We don't want the enzyme to start digesting you because you're protein. So your body's going to excrete this, we're storing in our cells as a pro-enzyme, pepsinogen, then we're going to excrete it as pepsinogen into the lumen. That pepsin is going to activate it, or excuse me, the hydrochloric acid is going to activate the pepsinogen into an active form of pepsin. Then that pepsin will begin digesting the protein. So that's what the chief cells are doing. Now, what happens once the food starts to leave your body and the acids are present? you're going to have a negative feedback. Because remember, when the food's present, the acid's pretty, isn't really that low. But when the acid really gets built up, you don't want to keep secreting acid for no good reason. The food's gone, the acid's really built up in your stomach. What happens is you have a negative feedback. Once the acid levels get to be so high, they're going to interact with the D cells. And then we're going to start inhibiting the digestive process because there's no reason to have it going on anymore once your stomach is cleared of food. So, you're, so your D cells are going to pick up on the amount of acid, the amount of stretch receptors, all sorts of stuff, but it's going to release somatostatin. You notice the little dots instead of lines, you see the blue dots? The blue dots are representing the negative feedback, the inhibition. So the D cells are going to release somatostatin. And the somatostatin is going to inhibit G cells and parietal cells. So if the somatostatin inhibits G cells, it's going to inhibit the gastrin from being released. And if it's going to inhibit parietal cells, then the parietal cells will no longer release hydrochloric acid. And the somatostatin is also going to inhibit G cells. So the chief cells don't release any more pepsinogen. Isn't that pretty amazing to think that people have figured this stuff out? Some of you, I'm sure, will be a little confused about listening to this a few more times. What's the take-home message? Food's coming into your stomach. Parietal cells are releasing hydrochloric acid. Chief cells are releasing pepsinogen that gets activated the pepsin food starts leaving your stomach the body picks up oh the food's gone the stomach is getting smaller the acids are building up let's stop everything so we're going to release somatostat and then we're going to stop the parietal cells from releasing acid we're going to stop the chief cells from releasing pepsinogen and lipases but it's amazing that we've all figured this out now just realize your brain is influencing this to some degree. So long nerves coming from your brain are interacting with this as well. So when you think about pizza tonight, it's going to kick into gear the parietal cells making some hydrochloric acid. When you eat a high protein diet, you're going to release more of this parietal cells and pepsinogen. It becomes activated in the pepsin. Interestingly enough, some plants actually make pepsin. 
when you eat pineapples, have you ever noticed your laps, lips feeling tingly afterwards? Anybody eating any fresh pineapple here in the Midwest? Yes? Ever open up a fresh pineapple? It's amazing. But your mouth can feel a little bit weird afterwards. And it's not just the acids. It's actually got enzymes called pepsin that helps you to digest food that you've eaten, but also digest your mouth and lips a little bit. So again, go back and forth and look at this stuff. Here you can see the somatostatin was released by the D cells and so forth. This is probably the thing that I would like for you to draw and think about for the rest of the class today or after you're done with this lecture as demonstration that you understood what was going on. I know it's a little bit complicated, but that's why I want, I want you to work on it. So I would like for you to draw this and turn it in with your summary of what you learned today. Anyway, thanks for your attention. I'm done with the lectures today and I'm happy, you know, feel free to email me if you have any questions or anything like that.